Let's spend about 10 minutes talking Kansas State football, basketball, and recruiting on KSO Today, a free daily podcast brought to you by K-State Online. Well, you've got me again on today's edition of KSO Today for February 4th, 2020. The morning after Kansas State falls to number one Baylor, 73-67 to last night in Bramlage Coliseum. KSO Today is, of course, brought to you by Legacy Insurance and People State Bank, both with branches located in Manhattan, as well as nine more branches of PSB specifically located throughout the state of Kansas. Let's talk first about last night's game in Bramlage Coliseum. I'm just going to walk you through it a little bit in case you didn't see it. Uh, K-State falls down right away, 12-2 uh, in this one. K-State turned it over, I believe, five times in the first four minutes, got to a real bad spot right away in this one. So they had to play through a hole uh, the entire game. A big stretch then came when, when Cartier Jada had a rough, I don't know, two minutes or whatever, uh, where he, he gambles for a steal, misses it. His, his guy hits a wide open three, really frustrates Bruce Weber. Cardi then responds by missing a layup on the other end, uh, gets teed up after missing the layup for drawing with the official Baylor hits both free throws and then hits a three on the technical possession to score eight points of that sequence. And now they're up 20 to four, a 16 point lead, their biggest, biggest lead of the game. Uh, never got bigger than 16. And that's what K-State has to fight back through throughout the entire night. They can't quite do it. Of course, uh, K-State did get it to three on a Xavier Sneed dunk with about 30 seconds left before halftime, a really exciting play for the people in Bramlage Coliseum, but Baylor was really tough. Uh, they're a very good basketball team. They came back and scored right before the end of the half to get it back up to five. It's just one basket. But the momentum felt completely different. Credit to Baylor for doing that. And K-State had to get a stop there. Wasn't able to do it. Weber was critical in postgame. I think rightfully so. It's like, hey, guys, we can't be celebrating after a big play like that. We have to get back and play defense. They didn't. They gave a big, a big basket there. And there it goes, you know. Uh, I thought Baylor really controlled the game throughout the second half. Well, never really blowing K-State out. You know, at one point, the lead did get as high as 15 again. But, you know, by the time the final margin was there, it was down to six. K-State did have trips here and there uh, where a make would have got it down to, I think, you know, four. But I don't know that they ever had a possession, you know, late in that game in the last five minutes, four minutes, three minutes. I don't think they did where a make would have got it to a one possession game. So while the final score looks relatively close and K-State was competitive against the best team in college basketball, it's, you know, you don't have to accept a moral victory, which I don't and you shouldn't, while also just ignoring the fact, you know, K-State was competitive. It can be somewhere in the middle. And that's, that's what it was last night. Uh, K-State played relatively well against the best team in the country, but not good enough to win. And ultimately, it's another loss in a season, you know, right now full of disappointing losses. Uh, if you look at K-State's last six games, you know, they've been significantly better. Uh, K-State's last six opponents in the net have been ranked number two, number four, number nine, number nine, number 41, number 49. So five opponents, six opponents, uh, two the same. West Virginia was two of those at number nine. Um, so six games, all in the top 50, four in the top 10. Three are at home, three are on the road, and K-State went two and four of those games. Uh, two and four is not an acceptable record, really, ever. But, you know, against four top 50 teams and four top 10 teams, it's probably about as good as any average team would hope for, let alone, you know, a team that's playing as well as K-State had but going into it. Um, it's, it's not acceptable, like I said, but we're still in a basketball season, so we're still going to talk about improvement Lack of improvement, whatever, in K-State's done that. Uh, improved, I mean, these last six games. There's no doubt about it. It's really not arguable. But for that to even matter or turn into anything, K-State has to turn it into some wins against teams that are of lesser lesser quality than those six opponents. If when K-State starts playing, you know, Bruce Weber said it himself. He said they got to get a road win at Iowa State Saturday. They, they have to do it. If they want, you know, to battle for, as sad as it still sounds, you know, the NIT, or if they want to make some sort of what they believe to be possible run in the second half of league play after they think they've gotten better, um, you know, they can try to do that, but it's going to take turning these good games against good teams into good games against bad teams for wins. And that's stuff K-State didn't do early in the season. You know, Oklahoma's not a bad team, especially in Norman. That was would have been a good win, but it's a game they could have won. TCU's not a bad team, but that was a home game. That's a game you could win. If K-State had a couple more wins, you know, against these teams, you know, St. Louis um, in Kansas City, it had some more wins against teams that they, you know, had played like they played the last six games, the season would be different. But these are all ifs and buts. The fact of the matter is K-State didn't win those games. And now they're put in this position where they have to get really hot going forward 
to salvage anywhere near what they would have considered a respectable season based on their expectations going into it. I do want to look at each player line by line. Uh, this is off the cuff. I don't have stuff written down, so these will be real-time kind of reactions for me. Uh, Dejuan Gordon, I think very quiet. You know, two points, one to five from the field, oh, two from three, four boards, one assist, two turnovers, 27 minutes. You know, he just not much shot making. He had two really good looks at threes. I remember both of those threes. He was very frustrated at the misses. Either would have been big. I think K-State was within double, single digits on both attempts. Uh, too bad for Dejuan Gordon. He didn't play bad, but very quiet. You need more than that out of a starter in 27 minutes to beat the number one team in the country. David Sloan had a really rough game. 0-4 from the field, did not score. I only had one board, three assists, two turnovers, 22 minutes. His worst, I know he's been up and down, but to me it was his worst game in some time. All things considered, I thought he really struggled in this one. McCall Wayne, I thought was pretty good again in some ways. You know, 10 points, 8 boards in 26 minutes against a very good front line. He's played against some really good front lines the last few games, and he's had good numbers. 10 and 8 is fine in 26 minutes. He was efficient. He was 4 or 6 in the field. He's 2 or 2 from the line. The three, excuse me, the four turnovers are a problem. I remember watching the game and thinking one got credited to him that probably shouldn't have. It Either way, it's irrelevant. He doesn't handle the ball enough to be turning it over as much as he is in 26 minutes. So Mac played well outside of that. Xavier Sneed played fantastic. 23 points, 7 of 12 from the floor, 4 of 8 from 3. Only 5 of 8 from the line, but 8 boards, 3 assists, 3 turnovers. But in 36 minutes, you might live with that a little bit as much as he has to handle the ball right now for K-State. That's a really good line for X. A guy who could not make a shot, to be quite honest, the last few games. Played really, really well. I think fans said it to me sitting on press for like, it's almost too bad that X's best game in a long time is going to get wasted in a loss. And that is what happened, but he did play well. Another guy who played well is Montavious Murphy. 10 points, 3 of 4 from the field, 1 of 1 from 3, 3 of 3 from the foul line. That's about as efficient as you can play offensively. Probably needs to shoot more. Um, but he's taking great shots, so I guess that's why he's not. Only one board for Monty Murphy in 22 minutes and 3 fouls. He did not turn it over, though. When you got a freshman who can give you 10 points and that kind of efficiency and not turn it over in 22 minutes against the number one team in the country and play good defense. He guarded all sorts of guys too. I mean, different types of players from Mark Vidal to Matt Meyer and everything in between. Uh, I thought he was really impressive. Mike McGurl, six points on two of five from the field, 0 of three from three. One of those was just a bomb late in the game to his credit. Two of two from the foul line, two assists. Uh, he did have four fouls, just one turnover in 22 minutes. An all right game from Mike, but again, just kind of quiet. You need more than that from a key player like that to win a game like this. Cardi Ajada had as fascinating of a line as he ever has had, I want to say. Uh, fouled out in just 21 minutes, five, so five fouls in 21 minutes. One of those a technical, four turnovers, most on the team, tied with Mac McWain. Did have three assists, did have three boards, did score 11 points. Was a really solid three of six from three. Uh, two of two from the foul line, just three of nine from the field. So 11 points on nine shots. Not particularly efficient. Particularly is a hard word for me to say. But I, I, that's better than he had been playing from an efficiency perspective as of late. But when you throw in fouling out, getting the tech, four turnovers in that eight-point possession that he allowed Baylor, um, that's tough for him. So, uh, But I know there's a big feeling out there that, that I could be picking on Cardi or others are picking on Cardi. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to be. K-State did not lose this game because of Cardi Ajada. Uh, there were other players who played you know, significant minutes in this game who I thought played worse than Cardi Ajada, David Sloan being one of them. It's not his fault K-State lost this game. The point is that he is a very fascinating, polarizing player right now because his stat line is all over the place every single night. And in some ways, it looks like he's helping K-State win. In some ways, it looks like he's helping K-State lose. And he's a fascinating player. He's a good player. He's had a good career for K-State. I personally like him. You know, I think I told this, I don't know if I told this story here, but if there's a player, uh, I think it was on the Bosco boys, if there's a player that I've had close to an unprofessional relationship with, it's Cardi Ajada. As I said, his high school coach has stayed the weekend at my house. My son has pictures of him up in his room. He asked me about Red by name. Like, I have nothing against Cardi Ajada. Um, uh, anybody who knows me understands that for sure. But it is a fascinating year for him, of course. Antonio Gordon returns to the lineup after missing three games due to suspension. He scores three points, just one shot attempt, uh, just one board. He only played 10 minutes, no turnovers. Uh, easing him back a little bit, but I thought he was fine for what he was asked to do. Levi Stocker only plays 14 minutes, two points, three boards. No turnovers. So you look up and down the line. I think, you know, K-State probably in a lot of ways, you know, Mac, Xavier Sneed, Montavious Murphy, and in some ways, even Cartier Jada and Mike McGurl, you could say maybe did enough if things go differently for K-State to win this game. I think specifically Xavier Sneed did, Montavious Murphy did, then McCall Wayne did. I probably start reaching beyond that point for anybody else who truly made a positive impact on this game. Um, so again, maybe Sloan. No, excuse me, Sloan I'd have towards the bottom. Uh, Gordon, Jada, Stockard, Gordon kind of in the middle. And then Sloan really struggled. Uh, overall, K-State shoots 46%. 
Baylor shoots 50%. K-State never led. Baylor led for 38-37 of this game. I just want to run through real quick and give you a sense of what to look for. Coming up on the site, Derek has thrown up, I think, four new recruiting stories in the last 24 hours. One is a Jaden Williams interview that's really in-depth as to why the athlete from West Des Moines committed to K-State. He has a story on Lawrence High running back Devin, Devin Neal, pardon me, and his visit where K-State stands on him. The only member of the top four players in the state of Kansas not committed to K-State for 2021 is Devin Neal, by the way, in case state's working on him. Story on a visit and a new class of 2020. That's the one that signs this week uh, for junior college defensive end Tyrone Tallini, if I'm saying his name right. That's a name to watch as this week progresses. Also, a brand new class of 2021 recruiting big board with 20 names listed on there to watch from DY. Uh, I'm going to close it out with a little travel you know, coverage info as DY has coordinated a trip for us to see the previously mentioned Jaden Williams in Des Moines this week and as part of our trip to watch K-State and Iowa State and Hilton Coliseum. So we'll probably try to get to Des Moines on Sunday, actually. But we'll do Saturday if that's what's best for him. We're still letting him pick the day, but we're good to go. So hopefully we can do a nice job on that and provide something fun and informative. Uh, okay, I think that's it for me. I'm going to get out of here now. I think you have Derek Young the next two days. So get ready for some football recruiting talk on KSO today.